Right, we are here we are in the Spanarium. We can call it all sorts of things. Spanarium, Spanarium. He is the foremost curator in Britain of spanners, and he has done it in a very scholarly sort of way, and he knows a lot about these things and what they were for and where they came from and how they evolved. I've forgotten what this one is. This is it's from eBay. This one's uh, the BSA number one. The reason I've acquired this is because it's got provisional patent on it, which means they made it before they'd been issued with the patent. And that means it's, it's obviously an early m version. And I can now compare it with one where it's got the patent number on it. How sad, you might say. <laughs> but I, th get, I get, think it's wonderful. It showed me this wall of spanners in the shed. I just fell on the floor laughing. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. It's got something like thousands of these things. If you've got three or more of anything, you've got to admit you are a collector. Just come out with it. So I'd soon got three and more. I started collecting spanners because I got one from my dad's garage workshop wall in Bothwell. It was an interesting slide adjuster and he'd obviously been given it and then when the boot fair phenomenon hit us in the, I think it was in the 80s, you know, it's not lo that long ago, and I saw these strange objects, rusty objects poking their heads out of rusty buckets, I was hooked. So the collection <laughs> has grown. In fact, they use the old Scottish term, it's gruesome. Um, and I've, I've found that it's, I can't hang it all on the wall and it, this is not a museum, this is a collection. I prefer now to put things away rather like moths in cabinets to, so that I can see everything and the, these tool drawers are ideal for that. This is one of my favourite, Mr Palmer of Harborne near Birmingham. He's very interesting because he, he, he stamped all his, or I should say he impressed all his tools with his name. Here we've got some other parts of the world, just a few. There's a, there's a few American ones in France, Belgium. The ones on the wall are just a few. I've got uh, two, I don't know, 500 German ones It's in two big drawers. I've got stacks of American, I've got them down, you can't see them, they're down there in boxes, piles, just piled like, a bit like herring. In fact, they hang up like fishes, don't they, a bit. I'm interested in Swedish Barco. The Barco company uh, used to advertise that it had invented the adjustable spanner. Uh, and it certainly did not invent, it merely it modified the great design of Mr. Clyburn, Richard Clyburn of Yulee near Stroud in Gloucestershire. And that is the only known example out of his workshop that I know of anywhere. And I spotted it on eBay, I knew what it was. Fortunately, no one else did. It's a very common design now because Sheffield made hundreds of thousands of this design. The Sheffield ones have a more pronounced curve at the neck and a straighter handle, whereas this one's got a lovely smooth contour to it. Personally, I find some of the spanners are like little bits of sculpture. They're absolutely amazing, but there do seem to be an awful lot of them huge filing cabinets full of, of beautifully um, oiled and greased and loved spanners, all catalogued by country. And so whatever he does, he does completely. One of the main things that, that has occupied me in, the, in following this history is, is actually pinning down the lives of some of the designers. And they, that has been the most fascinating thing. And not to do with the actual 
object, but to do with their going about. I mean, there's one, there's one bloke born, uh, he was b born on a ship in the Indian Ocean, and his middle name was Pericles. And wh why was it Pericles? Because the ship was called the Pericles. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and then he ended up in England and became a, into, a designer of adjustable spanners and bicycles, a maker of bicycles and, and motorcycles. So it, it just goes on and on. Well, I wanted to get him a present for his birthday. I thought, must get him a book on adjustable spanners. So I tried to get one, because I couldn't get one. So I phoned the librarian at the Mechanics Institute, and I said, do you have a book on adjustable spanners? And so he searched and said, there isn't such a thing. Your friend's going to have to write it himself. Right, this is the white room, <laughs> the only clean room in the place, where I'm going to photograph the spanners for the book. Typical of the over-designing <laughs> in uh, around about 1900. You angle the lights to get not too much highlight, not too much blandness, just nice bit of character. There we go. It's pretty painstaking stuff actually. It's quite different to playing the banjo for instance. Which is good because you can't keep thrashing on a banjo <laughs> for you, all your life. You go daft. Maybe I am daft. Maybe I started off daft. Someone's going to read this eventually. They might get interested. And um, they might find things under their bed that I don't know about yet, but they, they're going to be ever so proud to write to me and say, I've found something new, Mr. Geeson. Do you realise this is missing from your book? So we carry on. I haven't got long now to, to get on with it, the, um, to finish, the, to deliver the complete work.